We're continuing our discussion of the research process. In previous videos, we looked at the problem definition, converting from a management decision problem to a research problem. So just to recap a bit, um, management or a company comes to you with an issue and the first thing you have to do is probe and get to the heart of the matter to turn it into a research problem. So we talked before about how management decision problems are statements that specify the type of action required to solve the problem, and we convert that into a research problem, which specifies the type of information needed by the decision maker and how that information is going to be obtained. So as we move into preparing our research project, we're going to need to define the research methods that align with that research problem. So how will we go about obtaining that data that we will collect, analyze, and then make recommendations? And so we are continuing our process here, and we're going to need to make some decisions about the research project itself. So we're going to go through that a bit. And then what we will do is we will go through some of the documentation. So if we're external, we're gonna need to write a request for proposal where we're asking other people to do the research and bid on the project. If it's internal, then we are going to be specifying what it is we are going to do. So before you can start collecting data, analyzing data, making recommendations, we first have to go through a bit of the documentation in terms of setting up the research project. All right, so let's start here by defining the research design. So if we have this research problem, we talked before about maybe our research problem is, will adding sales promotions increase our sales revenue, increasing store traffic? So that research problem lends to a specific type of research design. So we need to be able to differentiate between those different types of research designs. A research design is your plan that you're going to follow uh, to answer those research objectives. Remember, research objectives are how we will know if our research project is successful. And an example that we looked at previously with the sales promotions, we would investigate the effectiveness of different sales promotions. So if we're gonna investigate different sales promotions, then what we have is we have a test market or experiment, uh, and that is the third um, type of research design. So what are these different types of research designs? The first type that we'll look at here, let's see if I can get this to right, here we go. We have exploratory. Exploratory research design. So if we're trying to gain background information, we're trying to clarify the problem. So if we go back, you know, in our process, let's just go back here. We did some exploratory research situation analysis here. Uh, so that often aligns with this type of research methods. That might be the secondary data analysis where you're looking at information that's already been collected for a different purpose, maybe by a different organization, maybe by your organization, or a focus group, so bring a handful of people together to brainstorm, or observational research where we are looking at uh, how people behave, maybe we're, we're, we're observing people, or we could be observing phenomenon, events that occur. Uh, so in all of those cases, what we're doing is we're gaining background information. We're using it to define terms. So like a focus group, if we ask people to explain, uh, to describe the, the prototype, the product that we have in front of them, we can use those words then in our future um, research, like if we do surveys to see if everyone else agrees, or we can use that terminology in advertisements. Uh, so there's kind of, we're using it to brainstorm. So we clarify the problems, we clarify our hypothesis, we use it to help establish priorities. So exploratory research is less structured, it is very open-ended, and the information is obtained right from either reading, so secondary data analysis, we're looking at what others came up with, or by observing, uh, or by having others help us in that brainstorming process. Uh, so an example of exploratory research, an 18-year-old named Brian Sodomore from BC, he was sitting at a drive through at a fast food restaurant and he saw this dilapidated truck full of junk. And he wondered, what do people do with all that junk? So he followed the truck full of junk, right? Observational research. We are observing people or observing behaviors. And then 
this individual, what he did is he chatted with others. So brainstorming here, what do they do with their junk? Uh, is there observed, uh, what are the different types of companies that um, deal with junk? How many are there? And ultimately this led him to creating 1-800-GOT-JUNK. So when we look at exploratory, we're using it to help us uh, gain that background information, help to clarify what the issue is, or clarify our hypothesis. If we do this, then this will happen. And uh, so it's very open-ended, very brainstorming. The second type of research design is descriptive. And this is where we are describing what has happened. So we are trying to understand uh, who people are, um, how do they feel about certain things. So we're often looking at who, what, where, when, why, and how. So if you're doing, if you're trying to understand how people feel, right, we'll do surveys that ask them about their opinions. If it is a one-time survey, we're just going to interact with them one time. It is a cross-sectional survey. If we are looking at how opinions or how people classify themselves, um, how people feel about things, how it changes over time, we have a longitudinal study. And a longitudinal survey uh, would have a survey, you know, a period of time, perhaps it would be before some kind of event and then after the event, and then maybe there's a follow up period later. So we can see how their opinions might change or how they um, they see things. Um, so we're describing and measuring, and in this case, because we're talking about marketing research, marketing phenomenon, uh, but the surveys don't have to be specific to kind of marketing. Uh, we could survey our employees about our operations. We could be surveying uh, people at our walk-in clinic about our services. And so um, we look at these research designs, whether or not you're in marketing, although often in business, uh, we lump all kinds, all of this collection and analysis of data that relates to uh, creation of our products and services or getting it to in the relationship with our customer as marketing. So the third type here is uh, our causal research design. Causal. And in this case, what we're doing is we are testing. So we might have a test market. So we might have a product um, or an approach to something and we would test it out as a pilot. So we might, like we talked before about, you wanna see at your coffee shop, if you sell brownies, will that increase foot traffic? You could test it out. One location, one um, coffee shop will offer brownies and we will look at whether or not sales and foot traffic change. When we t think about uh, scientific research, it's often in the form of this causal research design. We think about experiments, right? So we are looking at uh, how quickly flowers grow if I treat them with um, distilled water versus nutrient enriched water, if I use different types of fertilizer, which one causes the most growth? That's an experiment, right? If we do this, then what happens? And we can compare different treatments. Uh, so causal, we're gonna change some kind of independent variable, whether it's the presence of brownies or not, or whether it is the um, nutrient enriched water or not. And then we see what happens to some dependent variable like store sales, or whether we're talking about um, the height of the flowers or the number of blooms, whatever you're using to measure um, whatever your objective is, right? So with the causal, we say, if we change this, then what happens? And so we'll sometimes, we'll have a control group or we'll compare two different approaches or more uh, to see the difference, okay? So the we talked about exploratory is more observation, descriptive, we're collecting information through, um, through surveys and then causal where we are looking at if something changes, then what happens? So we need to make a decision as to what type of research design we're going to have. And then from there, what research method are we going to use? So we're gonna dive deeper in some later videos, use 
each of these different types of methods. And while interviews are not here on um, the list, uh, depending on how you structure that interview, it can be more exploratory, asking open-ended uh, questions. Uh, and so we'll go through that as well. Now, in addition to choosing your research design and your research method, the other thing you're gonna need to design is your sampling method. That is who is going to be involved in your research. Whether it's a focus group of eight to 12 people, whether it is a test market, you're deciding which grocery store location you're going to test this out in, um, or who is going to respond to your survey, you need to have a sampling method. So let's look at sampling method. So first we define the population, who is the greater group you want the information from. And then it's unlikely you're going to get information from everybody in that group. If you get information from everybody in the population, you have what is called a census. Okay, so if you survey everyone who you wanted to hear from, uh, then you have a census. But likely you aren't able to hear from everyone in that relevant group to you. So you're going to choose a sample, a subset uh, from that particular group. So for example, if I want to know about whether or not my advertising campaign is going to be successful, the population would be the entire demographic group based on age, based on income, based on likes that could potentially buy my product. But I'm going to maybe have a focus group that's just eight or 12 people from that group to look at the product and see how, and see how they would describe it or maybe I'm going to do a survey of just some of my customers, right? Because they're not all gonna answer my survey even if I give out free stuff. Uh, so a smaller group is gonna give me feedback about my products or uh, my service. So it's a smaller group from that greater population. Now, when we look at our sample, we have to determine is it a probability sample or a non-probability sample? When we talk about probability sample, a probability sample is a subset of the population, okay? And that subset is where every element in that population, so every person in that group, every element in, or every element, in the population has a non-zero um, chance of being selected. So a probability sample is also called a representative sample because everyone in the population has some probability of being selected then it is more likely to represent the opinions, the thoughts, the behavior, the characteristics of that greater population. And so because of that, because it truly represents the population, then we can measure what we call sampling error, which is how likely what we found from the sample is to represent the greater group. So the ideal is to have a probability or representative sample so that you take the small group, get information from them, and then it can extrapolate to the greater uh, population that you care about. Now it might be challenging in order to get that, um, that group. So you might have a non-probability sample. A non-probability sample is where a subset of the population all right subset of the population in which chances of selection for various elements are not known in the population, are not known. So because everyone doesn't have a non-zero chance of being selected, and we don't actually know what the probability of certain characteristics are of being selected, then what we have is 
a sample that may or may not represent the feelings of the greater population. So yes, we get the feelings, the characteristics of a group of the population, but to know how well they actually represent the greater population, we cannot do. So we can't determine the true reliability of the sample and how well it can it would represent that greater group. So the subset of the population in which chances of selection for certain elements, certain opinions, certain characteristics are not known. So we need to make a choice. How are we going to get participants in whatever research it is? Ideally, we want a probability sample so we can extrapolate to the greater group, be more confident in our results. There are limitations, and we'll talk about them in a later video, where we can't get that representative sample, so we go with a non-probability sample. We do need to, re to recognize that, that increases the error. Any recommendations or decisions that we make may not represent how the greater group feels, believes, behaves, their characteristics, and so that can create more risk uh, for our recommendations. But sometimes we don't have a choice. So we would decide to go ahead anyway, even though we have that non-probability sample. The other thing we'll have to decide is our sample size. So how many people? There are ideal sizes, uh, depending on the research methods that you're using, focus groups, eight to 12 people. Uh, how much variety, variability is there in your population? How many different cohorts? Maybe you have different income brackets, different ages, different geographic regions, and you want to make sure there's representation of all those different ones. That's going to change the sample size. And then we also have to look at how um, non-responsive. So if we send out a survey, for example, what percentage actually choose to participate in the survey? If that participation rate is low, we have to send out to an even greater group to get a big enough sample size. So how do we deal with that missing information, that non-response? So we'll talk in more detail about these later. But you're going to choose that type of, of sample, probability sample, non-probability sample through your sampling methods. And so we try as much as possible to get a representation um, of that greater population. So, for example, um, in, in 2006, a marketing research firm called Envi Environics Analytics determined uh, the best towns in Canada to represent any town uh, for test marketing. So the idea here is what towns in Canada um, have the similar distribution of income, of, um, of ethnicity, of interests, whether they're more politically left-leaning, right-leaning, right, which which towns best represent kind of the everyday, any town Canada. And Red Deer, where Red Deer Polytechnic is located, was uh, considered to be that ideal any town. And so Red Deer has been used for test marketing different products. They were the first to have pizza at Subway, um, when credit cards ha first had chips introduced to them, so we're going back uh, 25 years. Um, those things were tested in Red Deer. Why? Because it was deemed to be a representative sample of what uh, the rest of Canada was like. In comparison, a non-probability sample uh, in Vegas, if you um, go to, what is it, the MGM? Um, one of the hotels is where they host like the pilots for TV shows. And so they're standing around and anybody interested in watching a pilot TV show and wanting to give feedback. So if you're standing where people are walking, then, and you're listing uh, participation that way, then it's not necessarily a representative sample of the greater U.S. market, those who watch TV. It is those people who go to Vegas, those people who happen to be in that hotel, um, those people you're interacting with. And so there we have a convenience sample. We find the people that are easy to get to. And uh, that's a non-probability sample. But then it can be used here for exploration. People give feedback. You turn a dial to indicate part the like, indicate the parts of the TV show you like and the parts that you don't to help gain an understanding about how um, new TV shows will, um, how appealing they will be to an audience. But it's not a representative sample. It's a non-probability sample based on convenience. 
So we're going to look at these different components that we would need to decide on for our research project. Whether we're going internal or external, you need to decide if you are going to specify those things. If you're going external, you could leave some of these decisions up to the uh, researchers who's going to do it for you, or you could specify ahead of time. If you're doing it internal, of course, you're going to need to decide on your research design, your method of your research, and your sampling procedure. So we'll dive into all of these uh, as we go through the videos.